What's happening? Welcome to Wong Notes, Season 2, Episode 2. This is Corey Wong, your host. Today's guest is Jake Shimabakuru. If you don't know this cat, he is the most insane ukulele player I've ever seen. And that's the pronunciation. Most of us say ukulele. If you haven't seen his master class, yes, master class like all those ads you see online, he gets right to the point saying, hey, it's ukulele. Respect. Respect for the pronunciation and respect for his incredible talent and skill. I'm serious. I, I This guy blows me away. He makes the ukulele sound bigger than most people can make an entire acoustic guitar sound. And he's got such a unique way of playing it. He's got such a unique approach to it. But he also pays homage and to the traditional way that the instrument is played as well. We get into a lot of this stuff. He was kind enough to do this interview for me at four in the morning in Hawaii time. So it's a nice extra chill to the interview. It's fun. So enjoy this interview. Thanks so much for joining us. Let's get to it. This season of the Wong Notes podcast is sponsored by Neural DSP. All Wong Notes listeners get 30% off with the voucher code WONG. Neural DSP creates industry-leading guitar and bass plugins. The range includes signature plugins from some of the best modern guitarists, such as Corey Wong, Pliny, Adam Nolly Getgood, and Tozen Abasi. The archetype Corey Wong gives you everything from crystal clear tones to edge of breakup blues tones, whereas the 14 amp series delivers all the crushing modern metal tones you could possibly need. And that Nameless is my favorite Marshall amp ever. There's a plug in here for every type of player and you can get a 14 day free trial for every single one of them without even entering your credit card details. Find me another company doing that. Once you've found the ones you like, you get that 30% off your purchase by entering the code WONG at checkout. Well, Jake, thanks so much for being with us. I am such a huge fan of yours. I have seen you on the internet for years and I have yet to see you in person, but I've watched a bunch of your live show videos. I have some of your albums, so it's really a treat to have you on. Oh, man. Thank you. Well, likewise, I've seen a bunch of your stuff. I think you're incredible. Your band's amazing. And uh, yeah, you guys have a lot of fans here in, in Hawaii. So this is an honor to be on. So thank you so much for having me. Of course. Well, some of what I am wondering about is how you've taken this instrument to a completely new level. And not to put too much pressure on you or not to like, you know, sometimes <laughs> it's like, oh, don't, don't put so much on me. But you've made this new thing out of an instrument and you've done something that a lot of people may not have thought was possible on an instrument, which let's get the pronunciation right because I want to make sure that people are saying it right. So uh, can you talk a little bit into that and how you've been exploring the parameters and blowing the doors of the limitations of the ukulele oh thank you yeah um well getting to the pronunciation of the word it's actually the uh it's made up of two native hawaiian words and and i only know this because i was born and raised in hawaii but it's uku and lele and uku actually means flea and lele is jumping so it's it's really the the jumping flea is a direct translation of it and um, so, you know, I, I started playing when I was a when I was a kid. My mom played. I mean, everybody in Hawaii plays the instrument. So um, we all learn it in the fourth and fifth grade and all that. So, wow. But I, I just I just loved it. I mean, from the time I was a kid, you know, I, I just had a passion for it and started out playing a lot of traditional Hawaiian music. But then later uh, started to explore, you know, different genres and and I couldn't sing, you know, I, it was just, just something, I mean, I, I, I wish I could sing, but I, I can't sing. So I had to learn how to play uh, more melodically, right, on, on my instrument. And that's kind of what led to, to my style and, um, and my, my way of playing. But I just loved it. I mean, I, I never thought that I'd be like a, like a professional or touring musician one day. I just, um, it was always just my a passion of mine. And I had some opportunities, you know, to 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 play in certain areas um you know years ago and then when youtube came out you know that that really you know changed my life so i was just very very lucky very fortunate you know to be in the right place at the right time yeah i feel like you had 
one of the original viral videos in general, but for sure one of the most viral music videos. And it really paved the way in a large sense of the musician in front of the camera doing the thing that has just complete excellence and craft involved. I think, what was it? It was the While My Guitar Gently Weeps in Central Park. I mean, I remember yeah. watching this the week it came out. It was already exploding. <laughs> was this like 2005, seven? Where, yeah. What, what year yeah. was that? This was in 2005. And I just, uh, I went to New York for, it was my first trip to New York. And I was there to perform at this um, Asian American festival thing. I, I played at BB King's. Wow. And so while I was there, uh, there, there was a, a group of guys, they had a, a TV show called Ukulele Disco. And they, um, they, they just, they, they're real enthusiastic about the ukulele. So when I, when I was coming to town, they found out and they're like, oh man, we really want to interview you. And, and I guess they had heard about me, you know, from Hawaii. So they said, let's go to Central Park. We went to Central Park. It was my first time there. We found this little rock. I sat down, they asked me a few questions and they asked me to play a tune. So, um, so of course I'm a huge George Harrison fan because he loved the ukulele as well. And, yeah. um, so I played while my guitar jelly weeps and they filmed it. It aired on TV. I went back home to Hawaii and a few months later, I guess what happens was, uh, this was in 2005. So, you know, YouTube had just started out, but someone took this video clip, uh, from the TV show and put it on YouTube. And he also put it on a site called college humor. Yeah. So, so th those were the, the, the two, um, sites that it went viral on. And, um, yeah. And I just started getting calls from friends of mine that were on the mainland. They were like, Hey, there's this, you know, this video clip of you that's circulating the internet. And at the time it wasn't common to share a video with someone, right? Yeah. I mean, you had to, you had to have some serious computer knowledge to be able to do something like that. So, um, yeah, but it, I, Again, you know, just at the right place at the right time. And uh, and I like to tell people that I think George Harrison, you know, from up there kind of had some, <laughs> had his hand in that because, you know, his he loved just promoting the ukulele and yeah. sharing it with people. So I, I feel like he kind of had a hand in taking that song and having it go out to a whole bunch of people, you know, to share that, that, that joy that, you know, he always loved about the ukulele. That's incredible. I think there's two things about that that I want to explore with you and just get your opinion on. The first is just actual, the music side of it, which is you've got this instrument that's small and doesn't have a ton of range as far as octaves and doesn't have a ton of volume compared to a lot of other instruments like the piano or like a cello or uh, even compared to a, an acoustic guitar. It's, it's, a, it's a little bit quieter on average. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Yes. And then you take these epic songs like While My Guitar Gently Weeps or Bohemian Rhapsody, these <laughs> huge songs, and you make them work on this little instrument with four strings. That is such a fun and cool thing. Is there just a standard approach that you have to taking on behemoth songs like that and bringing them to your instrument? Yeah, well, you know, one of the things is... um I remember when I was in high school band and I, I was, I wanted to play the, I wanted to play the, the trumpet in, in band because they, you know, they, they wouldn't let me play the ukulele. So, <laughs> so I said, okay, well, I want to play trumpet. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that, that I, that I noticed right away with the trumpet is you have to be able to, um, to, to, to blow enough air to even, to even make a sound. Right. And, and, you know, you have to blow enough air to, to force, you know, I, I don't know the mechanics of it, but you know, you have to blow really hard to get a good, to get yeah. a, a sound out of the trumpet. And so, so I realized that the, the trumpet, you know, can can only play. It's it's a loud instrument, but but it can't it can't play very quietly, right? Mm -hmm. So, so you got you got this incredible uh, range here with the trumpet. But then I realized with the ukulele, I'll never be able to play as loud as a trumpet acoustically, but. I can play so much quieter, right? Almost to, to nothing. So with string instruments, you know, we can get like, to yeah, almost like where you can, you can't even hear it anymore. So I realized that by learning to play quieter, I can increase my dynamic range 
mm. that way, right? So I can have the same dynamic range as a as a trumpeter with with the ukulele, not as loud, but I can play much softer. So that that was a game changer for me, you know, when I when I realized that because then I then I um, then I I started learning how to play quietly, like really soft, and and when I started doing that. I um, I found that I could get all of these different colors and nuances with the instrument, you know, that you don't, you can't get when you're playing loud or when mm -hmm. you're really hitting the strings, right? Uh, at a certain, you know, in a certain, attacking it a certain way. But when you just like lightly just touch it like this, or you rub your fingers and you can almost hear like the, the ridges of your fingerprints, you yeah. know, that are, that you're getting that texture against the strings, especially when you're, when you're plugged in, you know, to, and, and amplified, you know, all those textures from, you know, all those sounds from the grooves in your finger fingertips and stuff, just like gets, um, you hear all those subtle nuances and it's really, um, it's, it's really amazing. You know, you can, you can get all these uh, sounds. And so I, I became very fascinated with that and it helped to really shape, you know, expand my, my color and tonal palette and allowed me to, try to attempt to take on songs where there's there's a lot a lot more color involved you know mm -hmm. like, uh, like you mentioned bohemian rhapsody right so using using different parts of my finger to emulate like the piano part or to mm. emulate like freddie mercury's vocal part or you know just taking little things but then but one of the neat things about doing something like that is especially when it's a cover you're a well-known cover you're at an advantage because the listener you know they they hear the song so they're already filling in all those yeah. all those other parts for you so it's almost like a duet with your audience because i'm not playing everything but i'm just i'm just um hinting you know at just the right amount of stuff so that the listener can kind of fill in the, the rest and i think it it kind of makes it fun and you know it's not as full i mean obviously my lowest note is is middle C, you know. Yeah. So that's 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 I have no bass bass range, but um, but I I think uh, my basic approach is I just try to hum, you know. I always no matter how how complicated the song is, I just I try to hum it first, you know. And whatever that single line that I can hum from beginning to the end of the song, I find that on the instrument, and then I try to insert, you know, whatever. I can do with the other strings to fill in those those harmonies or those supportive you know lines or counterpoints and things. Yeah, thinking back now, I can hear that you are leaving space for the listener to fill in some of the blanks. And I think what mm. what's unique about that is that every listener then has their own unique experience with the song. Yeah, they kind of have a responsibility now in the, in the performance because they got to they got to carry their own weight, right? <laughs> to, <laughs> I like that. Yeah. You talked about different techniques and different attack playing with your fingers on the string. Now, I've seen you use a bunch of pedals and amplification and all that sort of thing. We'll dive into that in a second, but as far as just playing acoustically on the instrument, Similar to somebody who's sitting down at the piano and has to figure out how to make different kind of tone colors or different mm -hmm. things. Like when you hear Brad Meldow sit at the piano, oh. you just know that it's Brad. When you yeah. hear Keith Jarrett sit down at the piano, you know that it's Jarrett. And mm -hmm. there's some things, like I saw Meldow, uh, just a solo piano concert once. I'm sitting right in the front row and within two notes, it just sounded like him. I was thinking I could just sit down and play those exact two notes, but I wouldn't sound like Brad Meldow. That's it, with a piano. That's really interesting. I'm mm -hmm. I'm curious on your approach on how you find your thing in an acoustic sound, but also how you can manipulate tone color and dynamics and what some of those just logistical things are there that people could learn from. You know, when when I was uh, when I was younger. I used to play with a with a pick, you know, one of those Herco thumb picks. Oh yeah, and and I loved it um, because I was really into Al Di Miola, and um, and I love that palm muted thing that he would do with the pick, so you could get, you know, it just it's just that staccato, and it just sounds, you know, there, there's just a really cool sound to it. Um, but then I think what really blew my mind, I had an epiphany one day when I when I saw this incredible video of. Um, of um, Jeff Beck performing. And 
I just couldn't believe all the different sounds that he was getting, you know, out of his guitar. I mean, they were just, I mean, he was making sounds that I, I never even heard before an electric guitar. He was, he was mimicking birds and stuff like that. You know, and I was just like, how's he doing that? But I, I watched him and, you know, and he's just using his fingers and he does all these really cool things. Um, Sonny Landreth is another one of my favorite guitar players too. And he does the, he does these things with his fingers where he just, I, I can't even explain it, but he gets like these really orchestral, you know, uh, orchestral sounds out of, mm -hmm. out of his instrument. So, you know, it was guys like that, that made me just kind of want to, want to put the picks away and just figure out ways that I can use my fingers. So my, my hands really, you know, so whether it's the back of my thumb or, you know, or the sides of my fingers or, or even like this part of my fingers against the string, just doing yeah. something like this, right. Or even rubbing it with your palm or, I mm. mean, all these things you get, you get these really cool sounds you can make. You, it feels like, like the wind or, you know, like, uh, like trade winds coming or almost like, like, like uh, like a string section, you know, kind of just simmering over over a, a chord, you know, just over a sound, and uh, and so so. Anyways, th those kinds of things. Um, oh shucks, I totally forgot where my what my point was. But <laughs> um, you know, talking about different things. Yeah. So I I oh yeah. So one of the things that I I found was um, was that once I got really comfortable and had good control and could find consistency consistency with my um with my my fingers and my nails and and i say consistency because it was it was like using um buffers and nail files and things like that to shape my nail just the way that 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 and bevel it just the way that i i knew that if i angle my thumb in this way and and pluck i would get that sound that i wanted or if i angled it back this way i would get that sound right yeah um and then you know do and then this sounds really silly but doing things like um using an emery board to file down all the calluses you know using certain types of hand hand lotions you yeah know, to keep to keep the the skin soft like people don't realize that but if you know if you have calluses on on your on your strumming and picking hand you know all the all those the the harshness comes out on the strings and you hear all these little um little scratchy sounds on on the on the on your attack and all that so you know so just just really trying to be scientific about it and and finding ways to treat my hand and my nails and my fingertips so that i can get that consistent sound every time you know so it doesn't matter if i'm picking up my instrument or i'm picking up someone else's instrument i can still find you know how to angle my fingers and my hands just to get that sound that i that i want yeah you're really kind of defining the tone is all in the hands thing. <laughs> in this case, if I got tough calluses on my nail or on my hands, it's not going to sound like me. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I, so your right hand, right from, I mean, I, you, do you have... So I use, uh, well, my index finger, the nail always comes off because when I play funk guitar, my nail oh, is always yeah, scraping yeah. against the strings. But I do have nails on all my other fingers, and sometimes, if I if I'm doing really well, I will have a nail on my index finger. And yeah, when I'm doing either a hybrid picking thing with picking mm -hmm. fingers, it just has a different sound. Like the attack is different if I have yeah. nails or not. And mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you're uh, pun intended. You are nailing it on the fact <laughs> that different different textures on your finger or nail yeah. will completely change the sound it's almost like using using like one of those little rubber picks or a kind of those mm -hmm. cloth picks cloth yeah. covered picks versus those felt picks uh -huh. yeah the felt picks those things mm -hmm. have such a soft sound and then you use a hard uh just regular guitar pick it's gonna have a different thing and why would it be any different when it comes to your fingers or nails so one of you know you, you talk about the felt pick and uh i gotta tell you this quick story so i used to have um i used to buy those uh these these felt gloves they were and they were i i could never find them in black but the ones the ones that i like were always like this uh like this baby blue color you know so i just wanted a black one but you know i could never find but but there was something about the those that particular brand and that glove like you would put it on and there was uh um just the way the stitching was 
it was really crazy because it stitched on the the inside so there was like this little the little bulk of, of the material and when i would slide my my hand in there that that part of the thumb i would just have it slide that where that so the um the stitching is it would just slide right under my thumb and give me just enough uh leverage on the on the glove so when i would pick the string i could use i could actually use my thumb instead of holding a pick i could yeah. actually use my thumb and i could get that same I, actually it was even a a warmer sound than using the felt pick because it didn't have that that scrapey sound you know that the felt yeah. pick has so it was just like the the attack of the the felt um you know the felt glove so i, I was really into that for there was a, a period of time where <laughs> i was always doing the glove everyone was like what are you what are you trying to do you yeah know? you but, were yeah now you would just be oh that's the guy with the baby blue glove that plays yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's not like that's the guy that does this incredible musical arrangement <laughs> of bohemian rhapsody you'd be like oh yeah that's that's the guy who plays with the blue glove right <laughs> it's like oh my yeah so i think i think it's good that you're using your uh your natural hand it, it's less of a yeah. talking point <laughs> yeah, yeah people focus on the art rather than the <laughs> <laughs> oh man yeah but uh, you know you just you just try all kinds of stuff i mean that's 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 what i that's what i love doing I, i've always been i've always been a tone guy you know yeah. just always searching i mean still just always searching to every little thing that you can do to make it just a little better a little rounder a little warmer a little mm. more pleasing to the ear like for example this is i'm going to use the, the back of my thumbnail here with this chord, again, here, here's kind of that minor second. I'm taking advantage of that high fourth string. I have the G in the sharp here. Um, but I'm going to use the back of my thumb to kind of get almost like a koto sound. Mm. And, and pick. And I'm actually pulling on oh, away from the instrument. Uh, so you're pulling the string up. Yeah. those kinds of really cool uh, sounds there. This is another, this is just using the flesh part of my finger. Um, more of that campanella stuff I was talking about uh, earlier. You could do like... I mean, it's just... This is like a, it's like a, you know, like that kind of yeah. classism in there. It's really cool sounding. Uh, uh, <laughs> so, I mean, all kinds of cool, cool runs like that, that I wouldn't be able to do if I didn't have that that fourth string. Um, this is, I don't know if you can hear this. It's yeah. better if I'm. Yeah, it's, it's more of, I, I think it, you could probably hear it. Def, definitely hear it better if it's yeah, plugged yeah. in, you know, with the amp. <laughs> yeah, you get more of that. Yeah, sorry, I don't have That's my all right. set up. But, no, it's cool. I yeah. love that sound. It's so cool how many different tone colors you can get. Just oh, yeah, with then, your hand, and then with the with the thumbnail, you know, you can you can still get using the the back and forth movement, you know, like you would with a pig. So where is that motion coming from when you're doing that sort of alternate? Because you're basically doing alternate picking, but just using yeah. your thumbnail. Yeah, just using my thumbnail and and moving it back and forth on the. So is that motion coming from your? Is it like a twisting of your wrist? No, it's, it's it, actually just 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 the kind of just just the the, the thumb itself. I, I guess I, I you know, actually what I'm doing is I I guess I'm kind of anchoring my my ring finger on on the on the bottom of the soundboard. Yeah, and just rocking my thumb back and forth. So, ah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Amazing. Yeah, and then 
before, like um, like if I'm string skipping, then I then I use my thumb and my index and and ring uh, index and and uh, middle finger. Yeah. So I can go back. And kind of things like that so yeah using using the other fingers just kind of getting away um you know just finding other other ways when you when you can't use the with, without a pick right yeah and then the other thing is um it's a little more like the classical guitar method right you know this way going back and forth this index way. middle yeah yeah i mean this this works too it's harder to get like quicker string skips because the strings are further apart right than like a classical guitar there's just yeah. a little bit more you know there's there's a little bit more space so i i have a hard time going this way and that, that's why i use the the thumb in the yeah and the middle or thumb in the, the index all right this is some good conversation i gotta remind you though have you guys not gone to that neural dsp website yet you gotta go check it out use that 30 percent off coupon wall that's my last name. And while you're there, check out the Archetype Corey Wong plugin. I guarantee you, if you are looking for good, clean, or edge of breakup tones, this is the plugin for you. There's three different amps, a pedal board, EQ, three different cabs. Come on! You can use it live. You can use it in the studio. There's that 14-day free trial. Check out all the plugins and let me know which one's your favorite. In the live setting, I've seen videos of you. You're basically just plugged in. And then, mm -hmm. and correct me if I'm wrong, and you're going, I, I'm curious on what your live rig is for your tone, because I'm curious as an acoustic guitar player as well. Yeah, so kind of my, my philosophy when I, with, um, with effects and, and pedals is um, <clears throat> the, 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 the first, the first thing that I, that I do when I, when I pick up a new pedal is I, pl is I plug in my instrument, I, t I turn the effects down and I just listen to what the pedal itself does to my tone, right? Mm -hmm. My natural tone. So I always, I always um, go direct. I have a favorite direct box that I go. Which one I do just, you use? Sorry to interrupt. I use the the DW here, right here. It's the DW Fern. This is like like my my go to. I'm not familiar uh, with that one. DW Fern. Yeah, DW passive Fern. direct box. Mm -hmm. Cool. And so, uh, so this guy used to i i don't know if he was uh he was he was close with the with the jensen transformer guys sure and they used to uh, make a custom wound once just for him for these boxes got it so it has a it it has a sound i mean it it's just unlike anything i've i've ever used um hmm. and uh and what what i like about it too is i mean you can throw this thing off a building and it'll be fine. Nice. You know, I used, I used to deal with, with tube, with tube pre's and tube DI's and all that. And it just, it's hard to, to travel with. Well, as, as you know, yeah. right. And, but so, yeah, so I, I, um, I use that. This is, this as my reference Yep. and I'll plug straight in. Um, I have these really great reference cables, uh, that I use, um, made by analysis plus, and so that's kind of my my gauge. So I go straight from my instrument into that. I listen to it, and then what I do is I put then I put the pedal in, and I listen to what it does, you know, to the sound. So I I'm so the pedals on on my board, most of them are all things that I feel just the pedal itself without even the effects, just the pedal itself, and it improves the tone in a mm -hmm. way where it makes it warmer, gets rid of some of the quackiness from the from the you know uh, pies from the piezo or or piezo I, I don't actually really know how to pronounce that but, I don't either <laughs> um, so we're, yeah you're good but yeah but there's there's one one pedal in particular that was a game changer for me and it was the it was uh, the Kafka by um, Orion Effect uh, pedals and the Kafka it's a it's a reverb pedal but there's like this uh, one of those Germanian chips in there that that. The, the, the preamp in the cap because there's a there's a dry there's a dry uh 
amp and there, I mean, there's, there's a, there's a drive and there's a, a dry and a wet. Yeah. And there's something about that, 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 uh, that preamp on the, for the, for the dry signal that just rounds out the tone mm. of, of the instrument, you know? Um, and, uh, so, you know, so that, that pedal really changed the way that I, I go about buying pedals because now I'll plug something in and the effect might be killer, but if it's like really killing my tone, then I just, I, I don't put it in, you know, I just kind yeah. of bite my tongue and leave it off. Right. So, yeah, so that's, that's kind of what, what I've been doing. Um, as far as like true bypass loopers, um, th this, this one, uh, specific Saturn works box just for some reason works really well with my setup. It doesn't take anything away. It, um, it just has that, you don't hear the electronics, you know, something, yeah. something happening. It's a, it's a little noisy sometimes when you, when you switch it, but, but you know, I'll take that over a good tones. <laughs> yeah. And you don't use yeah. a microphone on your instrument live? Not, not live. Yeah. For live, everything is, um, yeah, I, I got one of those, uh, you probably have one of those alien base station, uh, you know, that green. Yeah. So the, um, the, the amp sim on that thing yeah. is killer. It's killer, man. So I use it. I use it on my for my uke, and I I run a um, uh, jam pedals makes this this old uh, you know they're kind of based off of the old uh, tube screamers, but they're called the tube dreamers. Yeah, and they're made with all the old you know the 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 new old stock uh, stuff. I mean, it's it's great. But that paired with the alien base station is that's that's one of my my favorite uh, as far as like kind of overdrive you know that dirty dirty sound on for the ukulele yeah yeah that one that that combination works really well for me that's awesome i have a question about collaborations because your live show you do a lot of solo stuff but you also have a band and you've worked with a ton of different artists for you what's been a really surprising collaboration that you've had that you didn't expect to turn out the way that it did well what one, one of my uh you know this was i think in 2000 2008 i think or 2009 but um but i i got to collaborate with uh yo yo ma who was one of my childhood heroes you know wow he, um yeah he did a he did a, a a friend's record and invited me to do a duet with him so we did um we did um war is over you know the john lennon yeah happy christmas tune so we did a duet of, of that that was um that was amazing i mean we were uh, he flew me out to New York and we, um, and we, we read from the same music, sat right next to each other, recorded, and it was just so cool. Incredible. So that was, um, yeah, that was, that was definitely one that stuck out for me. Um, I, I just, um, I just finished a, 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 a collaborations record that, that was supposed to come out in October, but, um, but, you know, we're pushing it back, right? Obviously yeah. with everything. But uh, but with that one, I got to collaborate with with a lot of my favorite singers and musicians. You know, I mentioned Sonny Landreth earlier, so he's yep. on it. Cool. Um, Willie Nelson's on it. Uh, Bette Midler, um, Michael McDonald. So it's 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 a, it's a really cool ah. Billy Strings. Um, so I I think I think I, I'm really looking forward to it. Kenny Loggins. Um, so this is this this will be a fun one. Um, I've never done anything like like this kind of collaboration before, and all of it. The coolest thing was we basically all just went into the studio. I mean, well, you know, not not all of us together, but with every artist that that we we're going to collaborate with, we went into the studio, just and a lot of them. I just played ukulele and they just sang like uh, like Willie Nelson. I just strums. Uh, I I just played Stardust and he just sang over it. Are you I mean, serious? you know, in, in real time. So it was just live. I mean, it was the coolest thing. Um, oh, Vince Gill's on it. That oh was, my gosh. I've always watched Flair. Yeah, I got to send it to you when that? it comes out. Huh? Did Vince play guitar on that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So so we did uh, something, George Harrison. So we. Uh, so he played guitar and then he sang. And then uh, Amy Grant, his wife, sang. They did it as a duet. Oh so my it's, gosh, it's that like, sounds incredible. Vince is one of my favorite guitar players of all time. Oh my gosh, he's, I mean, yeah. So I'm, 
I'm excited. Okay, well, I'm I'm reading between the lines on this album a little bit, and <laughs> that sounds like the dream album of collaborators. But it also sounds like the album of people that's like, all right, yeah, there's a bunch of people that have these uh, winter homes in Hawaii, and they're looking for stuff to do. <laughs> we got Vince Gill, <laughs> Willie Nelson, Bette Midler, <laughs> Kenny Loggins, Michael McDonald. <laughs> They've all got these uh, these homes in Hawaii that they're that they visit three months out of the year, and uh, they're looking for a little bit of things to do. So, <laughs> why don't you just host uh, an album and yeah. they come? There, yeah, there's there's an advantage to living out in, in Hawaii sometimes. I think, yeah, that's yeah, amazing. Yeah, so uh, with with Willie uh, and Willie, Michael McDonald, Billy Strings. Um, yeah, there were maybe about four or five that we did in Hawaii. And then we did, um, Bette Midler, we did down in, in Los Angeles. It was a nice studio out there that we recorded at. Um, uh, yeah, we, what else did we record? Gosh, we recorded a couple in, in New York, in Texas. Yeah. Uh, R- R- Ray Benson is actually, uh, one, a good dear friend of mine and he's, um, he's helping me to produce this record. So cool. Yeah, so I cannot wait to hear project. it. I'm so excited. Yeah, man, I, I'm I'm so stoked. I, I want I want it to come out already. But yeah, yeah, we have to wait. So. When the time's right, it'll come. <laughs> Being somebody who's kind of transcended the instrument, I think that's something that's so magnetic about what you do is that you have, you know, and, and I, I'm I'm guessing this comparison has made been made before, so I'm going to expand it a little bit. Last season on this podcast, I interviewed Bela Fleck, who's somebody who's transcended the banjo. I have, you know, Chris Thiele is a good friend of mine, and mm. he's transcended the mandolin. And you have people like, I don't know, Michael Jordan or Usain Bolt or Michael Phelps or people that the thing that they do, they transcend beyond just that. And it's like there's this creativity level that's so high that the approach and the limitless mindset, or at least so it seems, is what helps get it to that thing. So is there a way that you, beyond just dedication to the craft of what you do, is there a certain mindset that you have when approaching something that you really want to get good at that helps you get to that thing? I mean, I, I love, I love playing. I mean, it's, it's my passion. You know, I, I just, I, I play all the time, but you know what? I, I got to tell you this, this story, cause this was a, a huge, um, this, this was uh, just so inspiring. So this was back in 2000, I think 2006. Um, I went out with, uh, with the Flectones, with Bela, Bela Fleck. And the you played with the for- Flectones? Yeah, they took me out on tour with them for for about uh, three four months. We did a oh whole bunch of gosh. shows together, and this and this is uh, you know so so of course always. I mean, I I held them in the highest. I mean, I was just I absolutely believe. I mean, I you know when I like I wouldn't even make eye contact. You know when I would see them, <laughs> I just be oh oh Mr. Fleck. You know, uh, but but one of the things that that just blew me away was because. Bela's playing is just it's just perfection. I mean, he's just so incredible. But from the from the time that the tour started, or even before the tour started, because we had the rehearsals, from the time that you know, I, I went up to Nashville, did the rehearsals with them, got on the bus and, and we toured. That guy never put his banjo down, man. He just was constantly, constantly practicing. I mean, the, the the moment he wakes up in the morning, he's got his banjo and he's working on stuff. I mean, he just just constantly practicing. And that was so inspiring for me to see because you think someone like Bela Fleck, like, what does he have to practice? You know, why yeah. why, why would he? What, what? But you, you understand that is why he is, you know, who he is and why he can do what he can do is because he never stops, you know, yeah. and it's just and he's always working on something new. Um, you know, I've only met Chris Thiele a couple of times, but I, I've never toured with him or anything like that. But I imagine he's got to be the same way. Uh, I just, I mean, they just, they just, and if they don't have their instrument, they're just thinking about it. You know, they're, mm. they're thinking about stuff and coming up with, with things. And, um, is that the so, same for you? 
Um, you know, it it was there was a period in my life where I mean that was that was all that that went on. You know, I mean, I would just it was it was my my whole life, right? Everything just was around the around the ukulele, and um, and then uh, and then you know, then I I I got married and had two kids, and then I started finding a little bit more balance, mm-hmm. you know, in in my life. So you know, I, and I sometimes I feel I, I mean I know that I don't practice as hard as I as I used to I mean no nowhere nearly you know just because you got other things yeah. going on in your life and other priorities but the passion is still there you know and I'm still you know I still um, I still I still love it I, I still put the time in you know when, when I can especially when the kids are sleeping like I'll <laughs> stay up on the side you know I'll work on work on stuff and really try to you know try to challenge myself um and it's been interesting, you know, during this whole pandemic, because you would think that, you know, we have so much time now to sit down and, and practice, but, you know, it's been really difficult to get into a creative headspace. You know, it's been difficult to write and hmm. well, for, for me anyway. Yeah. And, um, and, uh, yeah, but, um, so, you know, but, uh, but I, I, I love, I need music. Yeah, I can't. I I couldn't live without it. I have a question about the instrument itself, regarding the just like the visceral response that human beings get hearing it. Like when you hear an electric guitar, it a a rock guitar, it gives you a certain thing. Mm -hmm. When you hear classical piano or classical cello, it gives you a certain thing. A general context or world that the ukulele lives in as far as how people perceive the sound of it. It's got this soft, innocent, inviting sound to it. Is there something subjectively that you feel about the instrument that connects on an organic and human level? Yeah, uh, you know, I, I did I did spend a lot of time thinking about that at, at one point because one thing about the ukulele that, that I find and I don't mean to overgeneralize, but I find that people aren't really intimidated by it. Yeah, you know they're they, um, and I I feel like I feel like people aren't afraid to pick it up. You know they, mm. and and I I and I have said this many times. I tell people um, jokingly, but there is a lot of truth to it uh, that I feel is you don't have to be a musician to play the ukulele. Mm. You know I I I honestly feel that way, and I think with that kind of attitude. You're, you're not afraid to just try and, and, and play a few chords on it, right? Versus, uh, and again, I, I don't want to overgeneralize, but uh, but versus other instruments like, say, the violin, right? mm-hmm. or even the, you know, the, the cello, as you mentioned, or the oboe or something like that. People, if you said, hey, why don't you pick up the oboe? They'd be like, oh my goodness, no, I'll never be able to play that in a million years, right? They're so afraid of it. And for good reason, because those instruments are very difficult to play. Yeah. But with the ukulele, you can be, um, you can play a lot of full, you know, uh, four, four note voice chords with just one finger. Yeah. And you can get, you can get a, a, a sound out of that. You can accompany yourself singing. Um, so I think that, that, that immediacy, you know, just that immediate gratification that, that you get, uh, I think, um, draws people in, you know, they, they think it's, it's, it's interesting people who, who play it, um, a lot of times don't take it seriously. And I think there's some appeal to that as well. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, a lot of kids in, in Hawaii, you know, play it all the time. So I grew up, I grew up playing it. I grew up hearing kids playing it. I mean, whenever there was Christmas, you know, Christmas time or wherever there's, there would always be a group of, of, children or senior citizens in the in the mall strumming singing christmas songs with the ukulele we have a big uh a big santa claus that comes out every christmas this huge <laughs> like float and he's holding an ukulele in his surf shorts and, you know it's a, i mean so it's it's i don't know it's, it's just there's just something about it and and i i notice in my travels every time i you know, when I first started touring and I'd be on the airplane or walking through the airport and someone would say, hey, what's in the case? You know, is that a violin? And I'd say, oh, no, it's an, it's an ukulele. And they'd be like, oh, you know, I went to Hawaii, you know, for my uh, honeymoon. And, and they just immediately open up and start sharing these stories with yeah. me. And, you know, so I think there's something about it that that just kind of draws people in. Or it, it um, I don't know, it just, you know, people let their guard down, you know, when, when there's an ukulele in the room for some reason. So... 
I, I love that about it. When you're writing and recording your music, do you have an awareness of the cultural and historical relevance of the instrument? Or is that something that at this point you're just you're just sitting down and playing music? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I always I always, you know, try to especially because I was born and raised here. Right. I, I always want to be respectful to all the, you know, the, the players who inspired me and came before me. Um, that's that's one of the cool things about about being born and raised here is there's there's a whole like you know kind of like lineage uh, well there, there's like all, all these um I don't know like when I was growing up there was a guy named Eddie Kamai who was like the first ukulele virtual so you know back in like the 40s and 50s and and um you know he he was playing stuff on the ukulele that that nobody was doing back then because everyone was just strumming basic songs, you know, but yeah. he was playing like, uh, like Malagenia or something, you know, just, just things like things that nobody thought they would hear on this instrument. Um, and then later on, there was, uh, uh, another guy named Otasan and he was, he was probably my, my biggest influence. Hmm. You know, he played a lot of jazz standards. He would, he was, a just a great improviser and, uh, there, there was a there was a story about him, and when Chuck Mangione came to Hawaii to do his concert, he heard Otasan playing uh, in the. I think he was playing at the Queen Kapilani Hotel or something during that time. But when he when he sat down to have dinner and he heard this music, he was like, "Who is this playing?" And they said, "Oh, it's Otasan," you know. So he requested a table to sit right in the front and listen to Otasan play. And he went back every night while, while wow. he was in Hawaii to listen to Otasan play. So I, I always thought that was really cool. Such a cool story. But um, but yeah, so there, there have been, you know, all of these great players who, and of course, Israel Kamaka Vivole, you know, who was a generation later. He was the one who did the Over the Rainbow. Yeah. I mean, he was, he was, when I was a kid, I mean, we grew up listening to him and he was so... Um, he was just like a larger, larger than life, you know, icon here for us musically, yeah. and um, and not just musically. I mean, he just had the biggest heart and just loved, loved the people, you know, cool. loved the people here. And so, um, yeah. So for me, whenever I'm playing, you know, I always take that into consideration. Always want to be respectful to the traditions of the instrument, but at the same time, you know, um, but at the same time, you know, I I like to be experimental as as well but i always make sure that i that i do it in a way that that doesn't um you know that doesn't show any disrespect toward the instrument yeah. i guess i like that i and i'm going to check out some of those artists because i've i've been curious on the some of the history and some of the musical depth of the instrument and i think mm. you're one of those people for our generation who sparked that interest in the instrument and just say oh like what other stuff exists in that realm because honestly i think the majority of uke music that people have heard from our generation is like pharmaceutical commercials where they go through <laughs> like the disclaimer and they play some uke ukulele in the background to to make it feel a little more inviting and like you're saying non-threatening it's like you know if you take this pill you may yeah. get dysentery and your arm will fall off and, you know you're, but we're playing ukulele music in the background yeah but that's in yeah. the background to make it not feel so bad yeah yeah you know so i'm gonna check out some of those uh, some of those artists as far as so there's a lot of people listening that are guitar players. This is a guitar podcast. Yeah. And a lot of guitar players are interested in the ukulele and maybe giving it a shot. What are some things that people can do to explore a little more depth? Uh, I mean, I, I always feel like the ukulele is so much easier to play than the guitar. So I, when, when I see guitar players pick up the ukulele, you know, for them, um, a lot of times it's it's just, you know, it's just not not a problem. It's like if you capoed the fourth fret of, I mean, the fifth fret of the guitar and just played the bottom four strings. But one thing that that I do know is, you know, there's always this um, there's this uh, discussion about the reentrant tuning versus non reentrant and and can so you explain to so, people what that is? Yeah, so reentrant tuning is actually when um, uh, well, traditional tuning is basically when you have um, your highest string closest to the ground and as you go up the strings get lower and lower right yep. so so the string that's closest to your chin is your lowest string 
but on the traditional tuning of, of the ukulele, um, it's not it's not that. It's actually you have an A as your first string, and then it drops down to an E for the second string. Then you get to a, a low C for your third string, but then the fourth string actually jumps up uh, jumps up to a, a fifth to a G. So you have you have your two high strings on the outside mm-hmm. and your two lower strings in the in the middle. So they they refer to that as reentrant tuning, right? Because you you know you if you go from the from uh, if you play the strings from the fourth down to the first or toward the floor, you know you have a high string and then it goes low again. So it's like you're re- yeah. re-entering. Can you just again, quickly right? show us? Oh, I'm sorry. I- yeah. So if I play the string. See, so if I if I play the first string uh, that's closest to the ground, that's an A, then it goes E. I'm actually tuned lower, sorry. This is a C, and then it jumps up to a high G there. So what a lot of uh, players do, especially guitar players, is they like to change this fourth string to just a low G. Yeah. That way, then it makes total sense because now it's like the first four the first four strings of a guitar if you keep with the fifth. Um, is that blasphemous but, to you? <laughs> <laughs> no, well, you know, a lot of people do it. It's it's more of a modern modern tuning. Sure, but I like the I I always play with the reentrant tuning, and, the, and for one reason is because well, it's the traditional tuning, but but also one of the cool things that you can do with it is you can get these really great like you know cluster like these these uh, these very close voicings, you know, these yeah. minor seconds that that you can't get, you know. And you can keep your fi- your fingers are the the positions are so simple, but yeah. you can get these these very beautiful tones, uh, and and like uh, tensions right with that because you're you have it's like you have two two lead strings, and the other thing that you can do with it um, is uh, you know the the style that that Campanella effect right where you play a different string. Uh, Bela Bela does this amazingly. Like on it, I don't know how. He, he does it, but he does these cascading runs where he'll play like um, he'll play like a, like say if I if I'm running like a like a D minor uh, scale. So I'm going to play the D here. Go play the E here on the second string. F back on the third string. Right. And then G on the open fourth. Mm-hmm. See, I wouldn't be able to get that. Yeah. Otherwise. Right. So you can get, you can hear all the strings kind of ringing over each other. Sorry about the two; these are fresh strings, so they're a That's little right. <laughs> wonky. But um, the idea of the the Campanella effect is really it's it's one of it to me. It's one of the unique sounds on on the instrument. There was a guy named John King. Um, uh, I don't know exactly where he was from, but but he was a classical guitar player. And then he switched over to the ukulele, just fell in love with the ukulele and did a whole bunch of arrangements for the ukulele because he just loved that campanella sound on the instrument. And and it's really beautiful, um, beautiful, beautiful stuff. Yeah. I remember when you first, when I, when I first uh, was aware of what you do, I tried to transcribe some of your stuff on my classical guitar and realized uh... this is literally impossible because... I don't have that reentrant tuning like you're talking oh, about. So yeah, yeah. some of those chord voicings that you do are so interesting. Like you're saying, you can get these clusters that you would normally hear on a piano. Yeah, the piano. Yep. Yeah, but you chords, just yeah. can't get those on the guitar. So that's actually, I, I like that tuning a lot because it does force you to think a little bit differently. And if mm-hmm. you're open to thinking differently, then you can really <laughs> get some really some rich harmonic stuff happening that you can't get on the guitar. Yeah. The only thing that makes it different, I mean, difficult though, is like when you're doing longer runs, you know, you're because with the reentrant tuning, you're basically playing, it's like you're playing a three stringed instrument now, mm-hmm. right? So you don't have a lot of vertical movements when, when you're running yeah. through your scales and things. It's all left to right. So that, that's, that's what makes it really tricky, you know, just because, you know, if, like on, on the guitar, you can start at the six, six string and you can, you know, you can work two octaves easily down just by staying in one position, just working your fingers down. But on the ukulele, to get that same kind of two octave run, you have to start from here, and you're going to end up way up here at the twelfth yeah. fret. <laughs> so yeah, so it makes it a lot, a lot, you know, more challenging. I've seen people like do things uh, like mandolin players where they actually tune the ukulele 
uh, to fits, you know, mm. like like the like the um, like the violin or mandolin, and they'll play stuff because then you get this incredible range, right? When you tune yeah. it up in fits, now now you get over a three octave range. So yeah, well, I want to end with one last question, and it has to do with a lot of the people that are listeners are artists themselves, budding musicians themselves, some even established or semi-established, and they're trying to figure out their thing. They're trying to figure out how to make an impact doing their thing, and they're trying to reach the masses. Do you have any advice for people in those, I guess in two realms, one, kind of finding their voice or their thing, and then how to connect with people and how to go about, for you, it was, you call it luck being in the right place at the right time on YouTube in 2005. Comple- not completely, but kind of disregarding the fact that you have a lifetime of dedication to your craft <laughs> that you did to get there. But is there any wisdom that you can speak to people that might be wondering that sort of thing? You know, what one of the things like I, I always, I've always believed and it's, you know, what, what my parents and what coaches and teachers have always um, instilled in me is the, 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 the first thing to focus on is, you know, be a good person first and mm. a good music, musician second, you know, and as long as you keep that, you keep those priorities right, you know, then, uh, yeah, then, you know, I mean, that, that'll, that'll get you far, you know, and, and you hear, you hear professional musicians talk about that all the time, right? Like if you're a, you know, it doesn't matter how, how great of a musician you are, if you're a session player, you know, but, but, you know, you, you're, you're not honest, you know, you don't show up on time, you don't have good work ethic, you don't, um, you don't treat people right, you know, if you're not, if you're not a f- good person to to hang with, you know, like no one's gonna hire you, right? Or no one's gonna gonna want you. You're not gonna have those opportunities, and you need those opportunities to to get better, right? To improve your craft, to hone your craft, and you know. So uh, yeah, so I, I've always believed that, you know, um, you know, strip away, strip away, you know, what you think your talent is, and how, what what can I do to improve myself to still want people to be around me or, you know, or, 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 um, or I, I would be, I would make a, uh, uh, an improvement to a situation or yeah. how I can be that positive energy, you know, in, in, in the room. And I think when you focus on that, you know, um, and you still have that dedication, that drive, you know, and, and just a little bit of luck, you know, then that, that, that's what gets you far. But I always believe, you know, it's, it's, it's the heart and you got to, you got to be a good person first and um, before you do anything else. That, that really shows in your music, and I have always really appreciated it and connected to your music, but also just who you are as a person. That, that feels equally as magnetic is your fun that you have on stage, the joy that you show uh, when you're playing and doing your thing. So thanks so much for being with us today. It's really a treat to have you, and... I can't wait till someday I'm like Bette Midler and can have my own home in Hawaii. And then uh, hopefully before then, though, we'll be able to meet in person and hang out and play some music. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, man. That, I know. It's, it's such a crazy time, man. I, but, you know, I really appreciate you guys inviting me. And, and I mean, I'm honored to, to be doing this. Uh, and, you know, I'm a huge fan. Love, love your stuff, man. You're... Your playing is just is just so awesome. Well, I mean, thank you, I man. just uh, your feel, your groove, your pocket, your gosh, it's unbelievable. But you're yeah, too kind. So, you're too kind. You. Well, thanks. The respect goes right back at you. I love what you do. I cannot wait. You've got me so hyped for this new album of yours. So <laughs> you're gonna have to. You're gonna have to let me know. We'll find out. People can find you online. I'm gonna be looking for that album the day that it comes out so oh man thanks so much and we'll talk to you sometime soon all right well you guys be safe and thank you so much yeah for the support what a pleasant guy wow such an incredible dude awesome to have him on the podcast super fun i'll tell you what if you have not checked him out please 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 go do so right now my starting point for you will be to take a deep breath and listen to his version of Ave Maria. I think it's on his 2006 album, Gently Weeps, if I'm not mistaken. He's got a rendition of Ave Maria that just melts me. It's so good. And check out his videos because watching him is really exciting. He's got a fun presence to his performance. 
That's it for this week. Stick around for next week. We have Susan Tedeschi. Great interview. Great insight from her. So thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time. Peace.